Hey, you all, welcome back to another lecture. I know you are just waiting for the next one to drop. Here we are. We are now in a new unit. This is the Cold War, which I uh, briefly mentioned in Zoom time, that this is the conflict we enter into as a country right after World War II. Now we kind of just stumble and fall into it because our previous friend now becomes our enemy, and that's the Soviet Union. So we are frenemies with them throughout World War II. We had a bigger enemy than the Soviet Union, and that was the Nazis in Germany. And so once they are destroyed, once Japan's destroyed, Italy's destroyed, who's left? It's going to be the Soviet Union. And so we don't like communism. We don't hang out with communists because we are democratic and we are capitalist. And so we'll talk more about what communism is and uh, kind of what it is not, how it differs from us here in America and our uh, economic and social history. Uh, and so today's lecture is the first of about five. Uh, and then this is the beginnings of what becomes the Cold War. So thanks for getting your notes out and getting ready. Again, you can use your notes on lectures. So it's advantageous. And I know they've been helpful to those of you that have been taking notes uh, while we lecture. So that's my encouragement to you is to continue to take notes while uh, you are watching this lecture. You can always pause, right? So I'll try to go quick, pause on the slides where you need to take notes, but this is going to be, uh, these are good overview cartoons of what the Cold War is going to be like in America. It's going to take us from the end of the 1940s through the 50s, through the 60s, the 70s, the 80s. It's going to be over in 1989. So pretty much a 40 plus year uh, like war, you could call it that, although we're never going to directly fight the Soviet Union. Why? Because like this cartoon suggests, we're going to have our atomic nuclear bombs. Soviet Union is going to have their atomic nuclear bombs. So we're going to shoot little arrows, little daggers, uh, comments and, you know, mini actions back and forth to each other because we don't want to actually be killing necessarily their soldiers. They don't want to kill us in fear of we might use these giant ZHY bombs or atomic bombs, nukes. And so we're going to be in constant fear throughout the 40s to the 90s, pretty much of communism taking over, of communists here and trying to basically subvert our values and uh, be spies and trying to take us over uh, secretly or and eventually overtly. So this is gonna be the great fear, America and our communism, no! America's burning, these communists are coming and they're getting us, we need to fight back and resist. Okay, and so that brings us to our first slide. So the Cold War is a post-World War II struggle, it's after World War II, between the United States and our allies or our friends, our friendly countries that have similar systems of government as we do, and then USSR, which is also going to have their friends and their allies that have similar systems of government to them. So most of them are communist governments, there's going to be some socialist governments out there that uh, are going to look favorably and USSR is going to look favorably on them. And this is going to take us from the mid-1940s to the end of the 1980s. And in all of international politics, so how we interact with countries during this time period is going to be shaped by this rivalry, us versus them, the Democrat capitalists versus the communists. Okay, And so we're going to be in constant fear that they're going to expand their power and influence while we're trying to do the same thing, expand our power and influence throughout the world. Okay. And so who is the USSR? What are they? Well, basically, it's Russia. It's another name for Russia. And so the Russian word for the for USSR is the CCCP, which maybe you've watched Miracle or see some other videos. Uh, and so they have armbands that say CCCP. Well, that is the Union of Soviet, Soviet Socialist Republics. It's those words in Russian is CCCP. Converted to English, it's the Union of the Soviet Socialist Republics. And it was a communist dictatorship uh, headed by one party. And that one party would select a leader who essentially became their dictator and controlled all of the Soviet Union. But it's uh, majorly just Russia and then a hodgepodge of other countries that surrounded Russia, including Ukraine, Belarus, Uzbekistan, Armenia, Azerbaijan, Georgia, Turkmenistan, Tajikistan, Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, Latvia, Lithuania, Moldova, and Estonia. And you don't have to remember those countries. Uh, and there's also going to be other sort of friendly countries uh, to the communist Soviet Union. 
So I'm not listing all the countries that are communist, just those that become known as the USSR, okay, and the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics. They're kind of like the United States, although they don't have 50 states. You see it's a lot uh, fewer, like a dozen states, okay? And so this is a war that's going to be based on ideology and a conflict based on ideology, which is a fancy word for beliefs. So on the one hand, you have us. We are capitalistic economically. Okay. And so that's how we interact is you make things and it's private business. So you can go out and make a business and however much money you make or you don't make, that's your own prerogative. We keep government out. On the other hand, the Soviet Union keeps government in. Communist countries are what we call socialistic, where government is going to control business and be like, we need this made. You make it this much. And this is what you're going to charge people. Here's how much money you're going to pay your workers and who's here you're going to hire. So that's what we call socialism in terms of economically. Uh, and then politically, we're going to be democratic, you know, we, uh, and we're a republic, so we elect representatives in our republic to go represent us. Uh, the Soviet Union, they just have party members, so they have local membership and larger state uh, uh, or region membership and then national uh, membership within the party. And then the party kind of chooses sort of the members at each level and chooses the top dog, the top uh, leader, uh, kind of like a president, but they call them a premier um, or prime minister is what they uh, can also call them. So it's us kind of versus them, our values, ideas, and political structure, economic structure versus what the Soviet Union has, which is communism. So we value individualism, for instance, like everyone has your free and constitutional rights, your freedom of speech, a belief, uh, all those good things where they value collectivism, everyone working together, being unified together, everyone, there's no one that's greater or lesser than another in regards to race, how much money you make, uh, your educational background, you can, you have opportunities to everything, to owning property, everyone is the same, so we call that collectivism where uh, everything is totally equal, okay. And so here's the Soviet Union over here. And then here's also their other friendly countries that aren't a part of the Soviet Union per se, but are aligned with them and what we're gonna call the Warsaw Pact. And then these green countries are capitalistic democratic countries that we like, that we endorse and wanna help, okay? So Europe is pretty much gonna be divided in half between East Europe and West Europe. In fact, Germany, because it fought World War II gets split in half between East Germany and West Germany. Okay, because the Soviet unions came into East Germany, they didn't leave. So they're like, this becomes part of communist East Germany. We're making it communist. And then West Germany, where us and the allies uh, spread into, we weren't leaving either. And so we actually split Germany in half between West and East, East becoming communistic, West became democratic and capitalistic. Okay. So there's a couple of big uh, conferences that happened during World War II while we're fighting World War II. Uh, that I just want to mention briefly. Our first and one of the most important conferences uh, is the Yalta Conference in February 1945. We're still fighting Germany at this point, still fighting Japan. And so we came to an agreement as the big three leaders. It was Stalin of the Soviet Union. It was us represented by Franklin Roosevelt at this time. And then it's Great Britain represented by uh, Winston Churchill. And they come together and sort of determine how the world is going to look at the conclusion of World War II. And so we want help in the Pacific against the Japanese and we get the USSR to promise that they'll send in troops after the battle in Europe is over, after the fighting against Nazi Germany is over. Uh, they get three months off basically to transfer their troops from Europe into uh, the Pacific theater to help us fighting against the Japanese and in exchange they'll get some territories like Manchuria and some islands, and then they'll also get veto power in the United Nations Security Council in return for their uh, involvement to help us fight against the Japanese, which at this time we predict is still going to be costly, up to 2 million casualties to invade the Japanese home islands, which we don't have to do because we dropped the atomic bombs, but we didn't necessarily broadcast that at the time. Stalin himself, hey, he made the agreement saying, hey, I'm concerned about Germany becoming really strong and powerful again, so I'm just going to hold on to Poland and some of these other countries we've already have put our troops through to destroy uh, Nazi Germany. And so all that Eastern Europe part that I took over, I'm just going to stay in control of that. 
And uh, that's going to be like my payment back for destroying Nazi Germany and what they did to me. And then number three, Poland, uh, they decide that they should have a representative government where the people of Poland are free and independent and then vote for what type of, type of government and what type of leaders they want. This ends up not happening. Uh, and then number four, uh, they decide on the creation of the United Nations where the United States is going to be the chief sponsor. We even host it in New York City. It's still there. That's the United Nations headquarters because we want to make sure that we don't have a World War III. So we're utterly determined uh, to make sure we don't have World War III. And that's followed several months later by the Potsdam Conference. It's the new set of leaders, except for Stalin. He's still there from the Soviet Union. We got Frank, uh, Franklin Roosevelt has since died for the United States. So it's his vice president becomes president, Harry Truman. And then Winston Churchill gets voted out as prime minister. And it's a man named Lee Attlee who's representing uh, the United Kingdom uh, who's over here. So this is Truman, Stalin. Okay. And so they come. You know, at this point, Germany has collapsed and Nazi Germany has been destroyed. This is July 1945, and we're still fighting against the Japanese and will do so until August until we drop the atomic bombs. But they convene again uh, in Germany and decide, hey, we give the warning to Japan that you better surrender because uh, we're going to come get you through the invasion. At this point, Truman knew we had an atomic bomb and he kind of whispered it to Stalin and Stalin's like, yeah, I kind of already know about it. And it's a paraphrase because he had spies within our Manhattan Project uh, letting him know that we were working on an atomic bomb and we were close to completing it. So he already had as much information as the president. Uh, Germany was now defeated. We disarmed them, take their weapons away, saying they can only export, export coal, beer, toys, and textiles and some other small things so they can't export weapons and become militaristic again. Germany and Austria gets divided again, and then both of which get divided into four zones. We'll look at a map here in a second. So we really struggled over what to do in Eastern Europe over these uh, like Poland, East Germany, Bulgaria, Romania, these countries that were free and independent, then taken over by Nazi Germany. They had sort of Nazi-esque governments take, take over during World War II. And so deciding whether to let them be free and independent to decide themselves again, or the Soviet Union is just going to stay there became the major sort of first phase of the Cold War and fighting over uh, those Eastern European countries. So here in Poland, Germany lost its hat. So it got separated at this Odera River. And so Poland becomes even larger after World War II. And Germany has shrunk. Uh, but here's the division of Germany. So Germany gets divided into four occupation zones. I'll go ahead to this slide in a second. And so here was originally Germany going into World War II. It had the hats, it had this East Prussia area. And then what happens is the Soviet Union make it their way from the East and they stop here. And we make our way from the West and we stop here. And so literally as far as our armies made it, that's where we divide Germany in half. This part becomes what we call West Germany, which is a democratic capitalistic uh, portion of Germany. And then East Germany becomes communistic because the Soviets are there. And then tucked within there, you see the capital city of Germany called Berlin. This actually gets divided itself up into four zones, uh, but eventually being West Berlin and East Berlin, West being the democratic capitalistic government and the East being the communistic portion. And then the hat gets taken off Germany. This becomes New Poland or uh, a larger Polish company, a country company country. So there's four occupation zones, the French, the UK, and the US. This becomes West Germany or West Berlin. This is a picture of the Berlin city limits. So the American sector, British sector, French sector, they're all capitalistic and democratic. And then what becomes East Berlin is the communist Soviet section. Uh, and then just as I showed you in the map, all of East Germany is going to be communistic too. So it's kind of funny you have all this is communistic and then within Berlin, West Berlin, the western portion of the city is capitalistic and democratic. So it's like this little section of this big country uh, is not the same. It's going to be have a different system of government and is going to be supported by America, France, and Great Britain. Okay, and so, like I just said, Germany is going to lose territory to Poland. They're going to undergo denazification and not allow any offensive troops to take place to be in 
uh, in Germany. And so the German people are going to undergo getting rid of everything Nazi wise still to this day, it's illegal to even have swastikas anywhere. There's a story about a elementary schooler. He's third or fourth grade. A couple of years ago, he doodled a swastika. He had seen it somewhere. He put it on his paper. He's immediately expelled from elementary school. So they still take it very seriously to this day. And now they teach about it, uh, but it's a pretty watered down version of, uh, history because they kind of feel a lot of shame to having two world wars and kind of being the causes of two of those, especially uh, what the Nazis did and they allowed to happen in Germany. But Berlin gets divided into an East sector, as I said, which is communistic and then a West, and then they're not going to interact. And this is where the wall is going to be built. The communists are going to build a wall around eventually uh, this West section of Berlin because it's like an island of freedom within the communist country of East Germany. So we'll, we'll get there eventually. Okay. And so Marshall Plan, we wanted to help out West Germany, uh, West Germany, West Europe, and even East Europe uh, to rebuild, but we're going to invest uh, billions of dollars. You see in the United Kingdom, France, Italy, West Germany, the Netherlands, these are uh, billions of dollars. So $3.1 billion into the UK to help them rebuild after the devastation of World War II. So we invest a lot of money and we put, we attach strings to it saying, hey, you, we'll give you all this money, but you have to use that money to buy American goods, like American crops or American uh, uh, manufactured goods. So we had strings attached, but it helped catapult our economy uh, to the largest economy in the world in the 1950s. So the first kind of major conflict of the Cold War is what's called the Berlin Airlift or the Berlin Blockade. So the Soviets are in the eastern portion of Germany, as well as Berlin. And then in the west portion of Berlin, you know, it's going to be the Americans, the British, and the French. And we have a democratic capitalistic system of government in our economy there. Well, that's not going to make the communists happy, right? If we have this capital city and there's two different systems of government. So what the communists decided to do is, hey, we have this little city all around it is communist country. What we're gonna do is just close off the roads and the train, the railways. So the transportation from West Germany into Berlin, into West Berlin, we're gonna close that off. So we'll see what happens. Maybe we get to take over all of Berlin because we're gonna make sure that the essentials that people in West Berlin need to survive aren't there because we're going to close off transportation. So what President Truman decides to do is he says, hey, okay, you close off the roads, you close off the rails, I'm going to fly supplies in. You can't control the airspace, which he kind of could. So this was kind of challenging Stalin, but he's like, I'm just going to fly the supplies in. You can't necessarily stop the airways. Uh, and so he uh, issues the American military tasked them with flying in airlifting supplies of bread, water, sugar, you know, flour, whatever you need uh, to survive was flown into Berlin on a 24 seven schedule all the time planes and the Berlin airport are taken off and landing unloading and doing the process all over again for a little over a year, but it became a symbolic test of wills between Moscow and Washington DC, who is going to blink first, who's going to give up on Berlin first, and in the end, the Soviets caved, okay, they were finally like, fine, you're committed to this for however long uh, you're going to keep doing this, so we'll open up the roads and the railroads again, you can bring in your supplies, so you don't have to keep airlifting it, uh, but eventually they're going to build the Berlin Wall in 1961, uh, about 10 years after this event, 13 years to encircle Berlin so that they're not necessarily going to close off the roads or the rails. You could go through East Germany as long as you were going to Berlin. That was the only place you really could go uh, if you're going by truck or by rail. Uh, but they're going to get back at the West by uh, closing it in with the Berlin Wall. Here's a cartoon about an American military man. He's sitting down with his grandson on his lap. And he says, yep, Sonny, and them our last two medals I got for the airlift back in 48. You know, and you see he has a coal medal and a flower medal because he helped the Berliners survive and they needed those supplies in order to continue or else they would have caved to the uh, communist Soviets. So here's an ad from the Douglas Aircraft Corporation. It's now a part of Boeing. Uh, Boeing merged with them, but here they are dropping milk. It's the new weapon of democracy. Our airplanes are being used to help people survive and to bring them nourishment. Okay, I love that cartoon. So the Berlin Wall uh, is going to come about 13 years later. So we avoided conflict over 
this Berlin airlift blockade, uh, but the Berlin Wall is going to be built around West Berlin, again, to hem them in. So it was built by the East to stop people from leaving, because once communist businesses get set up and everyone gets something equally, everyone's paid equally, everyone, like life sucks under without that type of freedom. So people are literally leaving and coming into West Berlin. There's no wall, there's no, like it's a city. This side is uh, capitalist democratic, this side is communistic. And what you find in communist countries is that things are not that great. And so people wanna leave, but the communist uh, government didn't want them to leave, right? It makes them look bad when people are leaving their country and trying to immigrate to the capitalist and democratic section. So how do you stop that? Well, let's build a wall, just like we build a wall on our southern border to keep uh, immigrants out from uh, Mexico and Central and South America. We don't want that to happen. So you build a wall so you are keeping the people in the communist areas. No one was really trying to go to the communist areas. There are a few stories of them, but not hardly anyone. It's like a dozen people. But people by the hundreds were streaming into West Berlin to get into West Berlin and then get into West Germany or other places of Europe and America if they could because they didn't want any part of the communism and its system in East Berlin or East Germany. Okay, so the West again was the capitalistic democratic set of government, the East was communist. It became a symbol of the Cold War is this wall. We don't talk to you, we don't interact with you. You guys are on your side of the wall doing your thing, we're on our side. Uh, and so here's a sign saying you're leaving the American sector and it's in Russian and it's in French. And just so you know, hey, this is the good part, the American part, now you're leaving it and going to communist side. Hey, good luck with that, have fun. So again, here's West Berlin, the French sector, the British sector, the American sector, we're all going to be working together because we are all capitalistic democratic governments. Uh, and so then you see in the yellow, this is the line around Berlin uh, where the Berlin Wall was so that people could not leave the Soviet sector or the East Germany outside of the city of Berlin and then trickle into these sectors and have more freedom, get better pay, uh, have their choice of what they want to do with their life because uh, communism does not allow that. Okay, so here's a picture of the wall being built in 1961. Okay, you see it used to be just be like fence and barbed wire. This gets taken down and literally brick by brick. Here's a street that was here. Now it's getting bricked up. So literally that city is being split in half. Here's Kennedy arriving uh, in 1961 to look at the uh, Berlin Wall. So now he's seeing this wall that's been built up to stop people from going into West Berlin. So here he is on a platform that these they've built for politicians that go there and arrive, they get to go up and look into East Berlin. Oh, what's going on over there? Uh, not much good, it looks really boring. I'm glad I'm in West Berlin. So here's Kennedy right here. He's himself is looking over uh, in this observation short sort of tower to see what's going on over there. So kind of like a, a weird tourist thing. And then what would you see if you were looking over into East Berlin? Well, a lot of people are starving to death uh, even and, and without work or you know unable to feed themselves they're going to go through chronic shortages of food and clean water and sanitation uh, not just in East Berlin but East Germany and uh, all of uh, sort of Soviet occupied territory including in the Soviet Union things are not going to be that great so okay another country that's going to be impacted by this cold war is China uh, in which I'll just try to be brief with this China uh, historically had been a friend of the United States. We've been a friend of theirs. Uh, we kind of had a lot of power and dominion over them in the 1800s, uh, not as much as other European countries that were imperialistic and had colonies, uh, but China was basically kind of just a pawn of the Western civilizations. And so, but we supported the president and they get taken over by the Japanese in the 1930s. After the Japanese get defeated at the end of World War II, then they start a civil war that had been going on even before World War II. At the conclusion of World War II, though, the communists, with the support of the Soviet Union, gain the upper hand, and they end up taking over China and all of China. And so China becomes a communist country. It still is to this day. So China is going to fall to... Here come, becomes the leader like Joseph Stalin is to the Soviet Union. This guy's name is Mao Zedong. He becomes, he's the revolutionary that leads this revolution and overthrows the capitalistic democratic uh, government of China because he is a communist and they all dress the same. They don't want to look uh, really cool because 
They want to look like everyone else. That's what you do in a communist society. You look like everyone else. So, uh, but the Chinese win and still to this day, China is a communist country. They have not had uh, sort of peace movements. They've had attempts, but they've never had a successful overthrow of the communist government. And probably they won't because communist China is really uh, strongly uh, putting down people that rebel against them of uh, different religions, of different political beliefs. Um, and so if anyone disagrees with them, they come after you. And it's happening online now on the internet too. So, uh, but the People's Republic of China is the official name for China because anytime you have a communist country, it's the people that are supposed to be in charge, although this never happens. It's the leadership council of the communist party that's in, in power. Uh, pretty much like an oligarchy, a group of people in control, or a dictator like Mao Zedong was. He dies in the 1970s after killing, uh, what is it, 20, 30 million uh, Chinese people. He ends up starving most of, most of them to death in the late 1960s, early 1970s uh, through a cultural revolution. And then after he dies, they start some reforms. They allow private business to come in, which is still a weird deal because they're a communist country, but now they're allowing private business, which is why they're the second largest economy in the world. Uh, but again, it's all directed by the communists, what they allow happen in, in their country. A very interesting case, which hopefully you'll talk more about next year in your senior social studies. So, but at this point, by 1949, when China becomes a communist country, a quarter of the world's population now lives in communist countries, communist countries. And China is gonna follow what USSR is doing. They have one strong communist leader and then they have a communist party. So what they do is they confiscate all the land, they kick out foreigners, uh, they, and they kick out people for, like religious people. You could stay there, but they say you can't be religious. And then Mao Zedong makes his famous little Bible. It's called the Little Red Book, that if you're going to be a good communist, that's what you read uh, when you're elementary and high school. You have to read and kind of memorize this book about how to be a good uh, communist. Uh, and they're going to rely on aid and expertise from USSR and military weaponry from them too. Uh, and they're going to gradually become a US enemy, much like the Soviet Union, especially with the Korean War, which is the next thing we're going to talk about. So now that China falls to communism and a quarter of the world's population is under communist control, uh, Truman, the president at the time, is going to be like, we need to stop this. We can't have any more countries that become communists. So he actively tells Congress and the military, we need to intervene anytime that there's free peoples who are at threat of being overthrown by communist leaders we need to step in and stop them and make sure that they stay free in a democratic and capitalistic society. And so this sort of speech and uh, th these policies become known as the Truman Doctrine and that any country that is in fear of uh, falling to communism, we got to actively support them and make sure that they don't. And our greatest examples are uh, South Korea being taken over by North Korea, which was communist, and then also North Vietnam trying to take over South Vietnam. And we intervene in what become the Korean War and then the Vietnam War to try to make sure that the communists don't win. And we have different outcomes in both of those, well, kind of different outcomes. And we'll talk about them, uh, the Korean War next lecture, and we'll talk about Vietnam in our next unit. So I'll skip over this. Uh, and so one thing that we get that we form in order to help our friends around the world is what's called NATO, the North Atlantic Treaty Organization in 1949. It's still around, even though there's no Cold War, we still have it. So prompted by the Berlin blockade, the fall of China uh, and the Czechoslovakia government. Uh, so this put us in kind of a fearful stance where we wanna protect our friends. So when we wanna protect our friends, we make a gang and that gang is called NATO. And so any country that is capitalist and democratic like America is, we want to support you. And so we have what's, and this is the fancy word, a regional defense alliance. So within Europe, if you are like us, and you're like the United States, we want to support you. And so we want to agree to defend each other from attack. If one of these countries is attacked, then we all are. And we're all going to go to war. We're one big gang working together. If some one person comes after us, we're all going to go get them. Okay. And so it's going to, emphasize economic, political co cooperation, and just that each country maintains its freedom and its system of government without threat of being overthrown by communists. And it's still around to this day. So we still are actively involved in NATO. 
Uh, President Trump got more NATO countries to give to defense uh, and defense spending. It was pretty controversial within his first year of his presidency, which those countries did and have done for the last several years. So uh, everyone in Europe wants NATO around to protect themselves still against Russia. That's a big threat. And from China and then from uh, from terrorists is like their big thing that they fight against in Europe and uh, with us as well. So we're sharing information and military resources to help each other out. Okay, and so here's uh, just these bright green countries. These are original NATO members. You see Iceland is involved in the USA and Canada. We are, but we're too far away to be on the map, but we're all working together. Okay, and then after the Soviet Union collapses in 1991, uh, but in 1989, these countries become free and independent. They throw off their communistic chains and they join NATO themselves too. And they're still involved. Uh, in uh, in United or in NATO to this day, okay. And so, what does the Un Soviet Union do? Well, they respond. They're like, okay, you get your gang together, fine. But well, we're going to get our gang together, and our gang isn't called NATO. Our gang is called the Warsaw Pact, okay. So it's going to be the Soviet Union, and their Warsaw Pact has these Eastern European countries that are all communist. And so it was created by Eastern European countries as a response to the West German rearmament. So we allowed the armies in West Germany to rebuild. And then in response to the creation of NATO, of course, this Warsaw Pact is dominated by the USSR, like we dominated NATO, and they kept control and used it as a way to control uh, all these Euro Eastern European countries and keep them in sync and protect them. So again, any attack against Poland right here would be an attack against all of the countries. Any attack against Romania would be an attack against all of the countries. You see Serbia is kind of checkered here because they're going to kind of loosely be in it for a period of time. So, uh, so Luca, you could tell me more about that. All right. So again, here's another close up. You have all these countries. So the Soviet Union is also going to be these countries down here, but then these Eastern European countries are going to be a part of the Warsaw Pact over here. Okay. And so here's essentially what the world is going to look like. You're going to have those that are on the side with America in NATO, and so every country, even in Africa, Central South America, Asia, you have to decide who's going to be your friend, what type of government do you have, and therefore you're going to be supported either by America and NATO, or you're going to be supported by the Soviet Union and the Warsaw Pact. Okay, if you're a socialist country or communist country, the Soviet Union is going to come to your aid, give you stuff, give you money, military supplies, they want to protect you, they're like your big brother, if you're a capitalist or democratic in nature. We got your back. America has your back. We want to support you. And so the world is going to be divided into these two camps. You're either with us, America, or you're with them, the Soviet Union, and you're a communist. And so you can see ideologically, we're going to collide against each other for 40 plus years over just the way that government is set up and functions in the world is going to look. It's going to divide everything and everyone in half. Next lecture, we'll get to the Korean War, but we're not there yet. So Thank you for listening a bit over a half hour uh, on our first lecture, the beginnings of the Cold War. Uh, thanks for taking notes and listening.